record now. You should get a little prompt that comes up that says recording in process. Got it. Fantastic. So Barbara, thank you again for um, doing this interview uh, with me today. Um, I would like to really um, love to hear your story from um, your whole story from when you first noticed something had changed with your, with your health related to um, heart, heart failure, what's happened over time, and uh, if you can bring me back up to speed with your most recent experiences today. So yeah, I'd love to hear just your um, whole story. Um, maybe we can start by, if you can tell me when you first noticed something had changed with your, with your heart and when you first noticed something was wrong. My medical history is uh, COPD, uh, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And um, I started having uh, symptoms about 12 years ago. Um, I had had some problems with lungs before, uh, for actually from the time I was a baby. And uh, my doctor was very um, nonchalant about it, if you will. So what happens when you um, have symptoms of shortness of breath and COPD, and those symptoms are ignored and not taken care of properly, it leads to heart failure. So what happened to me was, um, as my COPD progressed and um, it got worse and I was ignoring these symptoms because uh, my doctor didn't think that it was necessary to be tested for COPD or anything. And this was before my diagnosis. And I pushed myself to get it done, you know, to work a little bit faster and go a little bit harder. And I really, really pushed myself. And I pushed myself to the point where um, I had a heart attack and I actually died on my kitchen floor. Um, they called it a sudden cardiac arrest. And this was the result of not being able to keep the heart and lungs going with uh, blood and good oxygen. Um, I spent a month in, the, in ICU. I had been intubated and put into a coma. Um, after a month, I was released to respiratory rehab. Now, respiratory rehab is probably the best thing that you could ever do for yourself. Um, whether you're going to cardiac rehab or respiratory rehab, rehab is fabulous because they teach you how to do things properly so that you're not exerting yourself beyond what your body is able to function. Um, I went to resp rehab and I felt much better. I was getting better. Um, I was regaining some of my strength. I was able to do some of the things that I thought that I could do before, um, before I'd been diagnosed and before this heart attack. Problem was that I did too much. And what happens, uh, you know, when we rehab ourselves, uh, we become a little overconfident. So about six months later, I had another sudden cardiac arrest, ended up ventilated again at the hospital. And what happens is, my lungs can't support what my heart needs. And so my heart works a little bit harder. Now, one of the side effects of COPD is shortness of breath. It is the biggest complaint from people with COPD. But when you have heart failure, the shortness of breath comes from the heart not being able to keep up and it has to pump so much faster to do the same thing that it would normally do. And so very often, and I'm, I'm thinking lately that as I am monitoring my symptoms and I have an oximeter that I use quite frequently, I'm obviously on oxygen uh, 24 hours a day. And as I'm monitoring my symptoms and what's going on when I become short of breath. Lately, I'm finding that it's more my heart than my lungs. So we can control my oxygen with the supplemental oxygen. Uh, but what we can't control is the water that sits around my, uh, around my heart. And that's, that means that my heart has to be twice as fast 
uh, as it should. I see. And uh, when did you, what, what, when, how long has it been since you were first diagnosed with heart failure? Um, after, was it, did it discover heart failure af, after your second heart attack? A year after, yes, yeah. a year after they finally said, uh, you have heart, you have heart failure. Uh, they thought it was left-sided, then they thought it was right-sided, they weren't really sure. Um, but because it happened a second time, uh, they insisted that I have an internal cardiac defibrillator implanted called an ICD um, in order to safely go home. Now, the problem with the ICD is that it actually it actually doesn't do anything for heart failure. It's really, and they felt that my, uh, the reason why I had my heart attack was a electrical connection, not a plumbing connection. There's nothing wrong with my arteries. My arteries are quite clear. Um, there's no blockages or anything. So they felt that it was a, an electrical disconnect of the heart. And that by putting the ICD in, if it happened again, it would at least attempt to restart my heart. But as far as for heart failure, it doesn't do anything. And uh, so now uh, my cardiologist, who is absolutely fabulous, um, has, uh, has me on a diet of uh, diuretics and uh, supplemental potassium. And so it's up to me to kind of manage that as best I can because he can't be here every day. And so uh, I have to be uber sensitive about how I feel, how much water I'm gaining. And I, gain the, I gauge that by my shortness of breath and my ability or inability uh, to kind of move around and do what needs to be done throughout the day, right? Right. Um, uh, and besides some super, uh, besides your uh, shortness of breath, are you, do you have any other symptoms related to heart failure that, and uh, how are you managing? When, uh, when my heart starts racing and I, if I exert myself to the point of uh, getting short of breath, my heart beats so fast that it closes up my throat. And I really do feel like I can't breathe and I'm really, really struggling. And so what happens is that takes all of the energy that I have um, just to gasp for air, regardless of what my, it's not my, because it's not my oxygen, regardless of what my oxygen is at, um, turning it up doesn't help. This is, I have to get my oxygen to the proper level because when my oxygen comes up, my heart rate will go down. Um, but I have to wait for that to happen because it's always a waiting game. How long would it typically take for, for, your, for your, um, your heart rate to go down? Uh, you have to wait. You have, have to, to wait. wait until your body catches up uh, with, what you, with what you're doing. I find that um, the winter months are harder. Uh, I have a, I have a harder time. Most of my uh, most of my attacks that I've had have been in cold uh, cold evenings, coming out of somebody's house, or uh, you know, and getting into the car, that sort of thing. So um, we have to stop, position ourselves, regain our breath, and then wait for. The heart rate to come down if for your heart to kind of catch up. I see, I see. Um, and these strategies, did you learn, were you taught these strategies from the cardiac rehab or the respiratory rehab that you mentioned? Yes, I learned, I learned most of what I've, what I know from uh, respiratory rehab. I have attended three or four sessions of respiratory rehab, um, especially during COVID since everything was uh, virtual, um, it was easier to join. And so different people teach you different things. And the last time that I was in rehab, 
uh, they taught me to actually breathe. Somebody actually sat with me and taught me to breathe. And that has been the best, the best thing since sliced bread, because once you can learn to master the breath, you are in control. Um, because it, it staves off anxiety and it helps you to, to know that you can control this. You've been here before, you've done this before, you know how to do it. And you're, you're far more powerful than your brain is giving you credit for. That's great. That's great advice. Um, Barbara, you, you spoke about um, one of your physicians being nonchalant about your COPD early on. And as a result, um, your, those symptoms being ignored, that's, that's what led to the heart failure. Um, how was your, um, I was wondering if you can tell me a little bit more about your, your experience um, uh, finding a um, how to, your cardiologist now you mentioned your cardiologist now is, is great like it's is everything okay with your health you know when I first went into the hospital they, I was diagnosed with COPD and so they took it from the angle of COPD and uh, um, you know I was monitored by a pulmonary specialist and uh, that's fine but he soon found out that he was over his head because uh, he's not a heart specialist and so uh, finally, we went back to the uh, specialist that I had when I was first diagnosed. And um, because I had several of these incidences where I was, you know, intubated and back into the hospital, you know, that's one thing that doctors do not like is repeat, um, repeat guess, right? So they were forced to really look at it. And finally, they asked the cardiologist to uh, have a look. And then we realized that I actually had um, more than one uh, or one comorbidity with COPD and that it was pretty serious. And uh, how did you feel when you received your uh, diagnosis of heart failure? Absolutely horrible. Uh, the doctor came in to me, and uh, this wasn't my cardiologist. This was just a doctor on rounds. He pointed his finger at me, and he said, you've done this yourself because you won't wear the oxygen. And you have five years to live, and you're going to die. Well, I hadn't been given oxygen. The doctor didn't want my doctor. My pulmonary specialist was kind of shy about putting me on oxygen. He didn't want me to have oxygen. And I was fine to go without it because I didn't want to, I didn't want to quit my job. I was still working at the time. I was a college professor teaching accounting and I wanted to work. I wanted to, I enjoyed my job. I had a fabulous job. Uh, so he told me then that I couldn't work. And so I knew I needed a, a cardiologist. And that's when I, I saw the cardiologist after one of my visits to the hospital. And he said, it's not quite as bad as what they said it was in the hospital. You know, it's not right-sided, it's not left-sided. It's just a malaise of the heart, if you will. It's just not pumping as much as it should or it's not working as hard as it should. Um, but definitely I would have to quit working. That was the sorriest day of my life. I cried like a baby and uh, I was pretty sure that I would have no value after that. That must have been so tough to hear that news and to be told that you had to quit your old job then. Um, I was only 60 years old and uh, I had planned on working another 10 years. I mean, there's no reason why you couldn't. And I had planned on working another 10 years and um, I feel like, I kind of feel like I was robbed of that, you know? Absolutely. And um, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's terrible. And what about um, some of your other roles at, at home or others? Has, has heart failure ha affected other social, other social impacts in your life? Well, heart failure affects everything that you do every day. Every time you um, get up from a chair to go to the washroom, every time you go to stand and 
do something at the counter in the kitchen, um, it affects everything because your heart rate, once your heart rate goes high, you, there's nothing you can do but stop, find something to lean on or sit down and wait for it to, um, wait for it to get better. You know, wait for the, your, your heart rate to come down a little bit, right? And there's a number of things that'll cause your heart rate to go up. Sometimes it's, you know, you can't have any alcohol. You can't have any, you ought to be careful about the sweets that you eat and the carbohydrates that you eat, because that all, that all plays a, a role in how you can breathe and how, uh, how your overall body feels, right? Um, when you become bloated, sometimes what happens is you, you have something like Brussels sprouts, right? And I love Brussels sprouts and I love all kinds of vegetables, but some of them make you bloated a little bit or they, they're a little bit gassier, right? And those are the times that you have those and you think, oh, I'm, these were so good. And then about half an hour later, you find you can't breathe. And when you're, when your breathing is tougher then your heart rate goes up. So it affects almost everything that you do. Um, how, how has a heart failure affected your emotional or mental health? Well, you know, at first it was very depressing. At first it was uh, very hard to, um, to get a handle on it, right? And I, like I said, I, I had to quit my job and uh, I didn't want to. Uh, I had to go on oxygen full time in order to save both my lungs and my heart. Um, I had to change every aspect of everything that I did around the house. I was no longer in charge of cleaning and cooking. I just didn't have the energy to do it. And that's, you know, one of the side effects of um, heart failure is uh, extreme fatigue, extreme, extreme fatigue. And uh, the only way that I could explain the fatigue that you feel is uh, a woman would know what it felt like if she had had a pregnancy. It's that pregnant fatigue that you're so, so tired. Um, and if you don't allow yourself to lay down in the afternoon and take a break, um, then your evening is likely to be kind of crappy, let me tell you. And what about socially, like see, seeing friends or going out with this? Has that heart failure had an impact on that as well? Absolutely. Everything has an impact on that. COVID has had, had an impact on that. My COPD has an impact on that. And heart failure has, has an impact on that. What the heart failure does is it, take, it robs you of your energy. So I can be walking, and now I use a walker when I'm out in public because if I have to walk any distance, I have to carry my tank, my oxygen tank. So I always use a walker because I've got some place to sit. I can turn it around and sit down. I can push it at something to lean on and it carries my oxygen, my purse and whatever else I need. Um, but it's really hard to get some places even with the walker, right? It's, uh, it's extremely hard. Uh, to have the energy, to find the energy to do stuff. Can I go to the washroom? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Robert, you mentioned uh, all the impact it's had on your on the heart failure has had on, on your home, at work, and socially. Um, how has your illness affected uh, those around you? Well, you know, uh, when I was in, when I first got sick, when I first had my first sudden cardiac arrest, I was in the hospital for a month and my family was fabulous to me. My husband was working afternoons at the time. He would come down in the morning, bring me breakfast. And then my son would come down at night and bring me dinner. And, you know, I always had visitors. My daughter would come in the afternoon and uh, so forth. So, um, I think that they kind of learned then that it was time for me to be taken care of. You know, I had taken care of them. And uh, my family is fabulous. Now, when I quit work and the doctors decided that, you know, I had to start taking it easy and I couldn't do all the things that I did, my husband quit work. And he's taken over and he's um, 
he's a housewife now. He does all the cleaning and cooking and, um, you know, all, all the big stuff, right? I actually, I work at my computer all day. Oh, do you? Yes, I have <laughs> created, I have created a um, chronic illness uh, group and um, it's a peer support group so that we can support each other um, as we're going through these things and uh, just give support to each other, you know. That's fantastic. What's the name of this group? It's called Catch Your Breath 60 and it's on Facebook. It's on YouTube. I have a blog. Um, I write some articles. I'm a writer and uh, I have a couple of books for sale on Amazon. So oh, they're all wow. about chronic illness and uh, helping those with chronic illness. So not is it uh, specific to heart failure or just chronic illnesses in, in general? No, it's actually uh, chronic illness in general. Uh, you know, we mainly do COPD because that's kind of what the group is. But there's a number of us who have heart failure. And so it always kind of sprinkles in, right? Um, most, of the heart does, most of the heart failure is acquired uh, through COPD you know, through the problems with COPD and that sort of thing. So, um, but chronic illness of all kinds. That's fantastic. I'm, um, that's amazing that you've kind of found this new passion. Um, uh, well, the, the pace sucks, <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but it makes you feel good at the end of the day that you've actually helped people and that um, uh, people look up to you and uh, look forward to how you will support them. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And uh, it's amazing that you create this group and uh, how to help others and, and help others uh, support others and for with information and whatnot. Um, Thank you. What about when you had heart failure? How did you, you know, seek out information and, and support? Well, I went to my cardiologist. Um, you know, I one of the things that I was warned about at the very beginning was not to Google it, right? And uh, I don't know, that's a kind of a plus and a minus, right? When I first had COPD or when I was first diagnosed with COPD, I Googled it and it was like, oh my God, overwhelming, right? So um, I tried not to uh, do that with the heart failure because I didn't want to be overwhelmed that way. I wanted to just hear the real news, what was actually happening and uh, what I could do to help myself. That's all I was interested in. So I got a, I got a journal and um, I started journaling my symptoms and I journaled every day. Then I took that to my doctor and uh, we discussed what these things meant, um, how we would identify symptoms and what we would do about it. Uh, when we did have symptoms, most of the um, most of the uh, medication that I'm on for heart failure is diuretics, and that's just keeping the heart the heart uh, a little bit drier. It's just keeping the water away from the heart. So um, used properly, they're excellent uh, medication. You just have to be really, really careful with them. I see. Um, and, and how do you be careful with them? Like, is there like, is it a rigid schedule that you have to take it on? Yes, it's, uh, well, we would monitor through, we would monitor my blood work. Um, and that's what that's checking is what the, uh, how the diuretics are affecting the kidneys um, and how, how much water is you're retaining, right? So um, we do that through blood work and uh, then of course we also have to be careful because diuretics will um, strip your body of potassium. And potassium, when your potassium's not right, you will actually end up having a heart attack uh, if you have no potassium. So you have to be careful that you keep your, your levels, you know, it's, it's always kind of a thing like this, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, 
Barbara, when you um, now uh, when you were seeking care for your for through your cardiologist and and whatnot, how difficult was it to navigate the system, or what was your experience like navigating the healthcare system? The healthcare system is horrible. Our healthcare system is definitely broken. I was extremely lucky. I have been extremely lucky with the doctors that I got because of the city that I live in, because of who I could be referred to and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, I think overall that the system is broken. I think it's very, very hard to get the health care that you need. And that if you're not proactive and advocating for yourself, you will fall between the cracks. Very easy to happen. And how did you advocate for yourself? Um, through journaling. Uh, I journaled, I asked questions, I brought back answers. I um, was very, very involved in my own care. When I go into the doctor's office, I know that I only have 15 minutes. I don't bother with the stuff about the weather and the crap about the kids and all of that stuff. I worry about, let's talk about me. Let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about why this is happening and how we how we can fix it or turn it around, right? So I'm very aware that the doctor is a very busy person that he sees a lot of people, not just me, but I always demand that my questions are answered. If I'm by myself, I record the meeting. If, if not, my husband comes with me and he's usually there for all the, all the meetings, but it's funny when we come out, he heard something different than what I heard. So very often recording the meetings and going over them at a later date and listening to what the doctor said over again is extremely helpful. We miss a lot. And we often hear only the things that we want to hear. That's so interesting. It's two, kind of two sides of the story when, when you and your husband. And I also, I also, um, all of my doctors, so my uh, GP, my pulmonary doctor and my cardio doctor must speak to each other. They must work for me as a team. And I ask them that at the beginning, if they're not willing to do that, then they're not my doctor. And uh, my cardiologist has talked to my pulmonary doctor and my uh, GP and they will share everything about me. Um, so working together, you know, they can really help each other to help me. How did you get them to talk to each other? I demanded, I went in and told them, my daughter's a social worker and uh, she helped me navigate the system because I would never have known. And she said, you know, you have rights as a patient. These are your rights. And so I went in and I told the doctor on the first day, I need you to talk to my cardiologist and I need you to accept calls from my cardiologist if he needs to talk to you. And uh, both of them agreed with it. They thought it was a great idea because they understand that they are a specialist in one field, but they're not a, you know, a pulmonary and cardiologist. They're just not. So, and they can't, they can't be um, an expert in everything, right? And they only see one part of you, right? Yes. Yeah, they're both looking for different things, right? That's so true. Wow, yeah. that's amazing that you've had your your daughter. Your daughter was able to help you. Um, you know. Oh, my daughter was fabulous with me. She was absolutely fabulous, and she taught me to talk to the nurses and how to do it properly. You know, it's funny when you're in the hospital. You know, the doctor knows everything, but the doctor doesn't tell you a lot of stuff. If you really want to know what's going on in the chart, the nurses have read your chart. And they're the people to ask the questions of, not the doctor, he's not gonna tell you anything. He just knows it in his head. He doesn't have to explain it. But the nurses love a teaching moment. And so when I get in the hospital, I can always talk to the nurses and they'll tell me everything that's, that's happened, everything that's in my chart and it's wonderful. That's such an interesting tidbit. Oh, wow, what your strategy for getting the information that you need. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I, uh, you know, that's the fact that you had your daughter to help you navigate through the system. Can you imagine, like, if you somebody who didn't have that kind of insight? Or... I hear it every day from people. 
uh, the states is, let's just not talk about that because that's a whole different story. But um, even in Canada and uh, a lot of the, you know, the provinces, the Western provinces and that if you're on the outskirts of the provinces, if you're not in the city center or right in the core, um, you're getting sub-level care. There's just not the specialists, you know, um, as you get into the more rural areas, there's just not uh, the specialties that you really need. So for those people, you know, they're traveling to Hamilton hospitals or, um, you know, to local hospitals and uh, centers, right? That's so true. Yeah. And remind me, Barbara, you're, you're located in a in, uh, larger city. Uh, yes, I'm in Hamilton, Ontario. Hamilton. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, and that's another reason why we're trying to, you know, make sure when we do the, our, our interviews, we, we capture uh, a diverse, uh, geographically diverse range of participants as uh -huh. well, for their story. Yeah. Uh, um, every time that I've even been in rehab, there's been people from the north who had to come down and spend the week uh, at the hospital and uh, go back on the weekends. It's right, hard to right. drive every day. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you were back to your care with the healthcare pro providers, when you were, um, when you're, when you're, whenever you're dealing with your healthcare providers, how involved were you with your treatment decisions? Like, were you involved as you as much as you wanted to be, or yes. Um, when, when I was first diagnosed, uh, my cardiologist put me on beta blockers and, um, that's normally what you would do. Beta blocker is normally the remedy for a high heart rate. And what was happening with me is that my heart rate was going so high that it was dangerous and it just stopped. So they tried to put me on beta blockers. First of all, people with COPD should never have beta blockers. Um, because your lungs are so compromised that we're, back, we're basically compromising the heart as well. And, you know, it just doesn't work that way. So um, at first I was like, I couldn't move out of bed. I actually had no, no um, pulse, if you will. There was no pulse. They couldn't get a blood pressure at all. And they realized that the, the, um, the amount was extremely high. And so they took it down to about a quarter of a tablet once a day, but even that was so high. And so I asked them if we could, if we could just try not having the beta blockers and, um, you know, they listened. He brought, my cardiologist brought a team in who discussed it. Um, he didn't make that decision on his own because, you know, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, um, uh, big decision to make, to take somebody off of beta blockers. You just don't do that lightly. And uh, he brought in a team, they discussed it. They looked at my records and uh, they agreed that I didn't need to be on the beta blockers. And that was fabulous because the beta blockers really, you feel like you're dragging 30 pounds behind you. So everything that you do is, is uh, harder to accomplish, right? So it was great, I loved being off the beta blockers. So that was just one, that was just one of the examples of how we, worked around it. And of course, my pulmonary doctor agreed wholeheartedly to get me off the beta blockers, right? But he wouldn't do it because he's not the heart specialist. That's right. Um, and did you ever have disagreements with uh, any treatment options or decisions or your, or your care with healthcare providers? Um, the only, the only, the only time that I can tell you that I was really disappointed was right before I was diagnosed. When I went to my GP and I said, you know, something's going on. My heart's pounding out of my chest. I can't walk more than a half block without stopping and blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me like I had three holes in my head. Now I had had two bouts of pneumonia, two bouts of pleurisy in the last two years. And I was a pack a day smoker. So those are the indications that we know now uh, that person should have a spirometry. And when I asked for it, my family doctor thought I was playing the system. Finally, he relented and let me go for the spirometry test, which is an easy, easy, inexpensive test. 
and it came back that I had a severe COPD and that I had already started to cause heart failure. I had already, it had already started causing heart damage. So I was really disappointed with that doctor. And uh, I soon found out that um, I could be taken care of by my, between my cardiologist and my pulmonary doctor um, without having to see him too much. So he's since retired, so. Wow, wow, okay. Um, now, um, if we can go back to um, kind of your lifestyle since you, your diagnosis, um, how did you modify your lifestyle in, uh, in response to our failure symptoms that you've described? 90 degrees. I quit smoking the day I was diagnosed. Um, by that time, I had only been smoking maybe one or two cigarettes a day. I just didn't want to give it up. You'd have to be a smoker. I'm, I'm sure that you're not a smoker, but you would have to be a smoker to possibly understand what I was going through. And uh, I had kind of proved that I could quit. So I thought, okay, well, I don't have to now. But then I, it got to the point where I couldn't breathe anymore. Um, so I quit smoking right away. Uh, I attended rehab within a month. I um, started to exercise and uh, use my breath properly, right? And I started to recognize when my heart was beating too hard when I, because as soon as my heart starts beating too hard, I can feel it in my, in my neck. And that's my cue to, to uh, sit down and uh, recover, if you will. Um, so diet, exercise, and positive thinking. Uh, using mindfulness, we, we had a CBD core, a cognitive behavioral course, CBT uh, therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and I, I used a lot of that uh, uh, education that I got there. And uh, I, I went full circle into mindfulness. So diet, exercise, and uh, keeping my thoughts positive. Those were the three things that really turned things around. My life became about me. Uh, it was no longer about the kids in the house and the dogs and the cats and the husband. It was about me now. And so I started taking the time to take care of myself. And that was fabulous. That was a great experience. No, oh, that's so interesting you say that. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I've heard from other participants too that, you know, some of their because of because as a as a woman, they they're kind of been the caretakers uh, for their caregivers for for their home. This, this and uh, the fact that you mentioned it's time for to to take care of yourself. That's it's yeah. it's, it's your time now. You got to look after yourself. It's super interesting. Well, if we don't come to that conclusion, then we miss the lesson. Uh, when you get this sick, it means that uh, you haven't been doing a good job at taking care of yourself. You haven't watched what's going on. You haven't been paying attention. Um, and either has anybody else. When I, uh, I was sick for about six months, I had the, I had the uh, symptoms of COPD about 12 years before I was diagnosed. And it's a progressively... It's a disease that gets progressively worse. So uh, what got me um, at the end, though, was the fatigue from heart failure. And this fatigue, like I said before, it just causes you to be so tired. You just are so tired, so, so tired. And you can sleep for a whole night and still not get a good rest and wake up being as tired as you were when you went to bed. So that's what got me in the end. I was sleeping every afternoon. I was working part-time and I was sleeping every afternoon um, and getting up and going right back to bed at night. It's very unusual for me because I've had insomnia all my life. And this was the first time that I could sleep, but um, I never felt refreshed when I woke up in the morning. So, uh, yeah, you either you either wake up and start taking care of yourself, or like I said, you've you've missed the lesson. 
you have to go back and um, learn it again. Um, what advice do you have for other women living with heart failure? Don't stop screaming. To say it out loud, tell them what you're, what you're after, tell them what your, what your symptoms are. And uh, you know, far too many women are diagnosed with anxiety when it's actually, when they're actually having a heart attack. Um, you have to stop being afraid of telling people what your problem is and how you feel. And if you don't understand, you have to ask other people what's going on. Um, you've got to speak to a doctor and you have to get a doctor who uh, will listen. If you don't have a doctor who will listen, find a doctor who will listen, um, but never stop screaming till you get what you want. That's great advice. And it goes back to advocating for yourself that you talked about earlier, right? It does go back to that. And, that, and the fact that we, we believe doctors based on a short, uh, a short examination, we believe that doctors are God. And you know what, they're not. I have learned that doctors have more to learn from their patients than we actually have of doctors. We are the experts, we are the ones with the disease. So we are the experts that tell you uh, what is happening. And all you have to do is mirror it back to me and it will come to you like what, what the problem is, right? Um, but never stop screaming until you're happy with your diagnosis. That uh, leads to my next question perfectly. What advice do you have for healthcare providers caring for women with heart failure? I think that, um, I think doctors need to start listening. They need to tar start taking things, especially women's diseases, a little more seriously. The days of the days of being um, uh, of having anxiety and ending up in the hospital are over. The reason why we have anxiety, there is a reason why we have anxiety, and there's a reason why we feel the way that we feel. And doctors have to start listening. They have to. <sighs> doctors have to get past themselves, and stop thinking that they're gods because they're not. Uh, they are professionals who need to treat us with the respect that we're due. Well said, that's great. Um, now, uh, couple, just a couple more questions for you, Barbara. Um, is there anything that you now know um, that you wish you had known at the beginning uh, of your journey with heart failure? Well, I now know that that job that I cried over because I didn't want to give it up and I didn't think that I could leave it. And I felt that I was letting my students down, uh, replaced me in five minutes. They didn't even have a goodbye for me. So, you know, people worry about their jobs and what position they're going to be in and everything. Things work out, right? And uh, keeping your thoughts positive is the most important thing. Um, there's lots on the internet to teach you how to be positive. There's people to ask lots of, there's lots and lots of peer support out there. Just sometimes you have to go find it and being, being supported by others is, is exceptional. It's an exceptional, uh, uh, thing because, um, people are more, more than willing to support you and talk to you about what's going on and and what you think. Now we have to defer to the doctors because they can take the tests that verify they have the evidence-based information. Um, but we can have some evidence-based information too if we journal and write things down and keep track of them. That also is evidence-based information. So um, I think that how I changed, I no longer sweat the small stuff. I don't worry about money. If we have it, we have it. And if we don't, we don't. Um, we no longer are supporting a family. There's my husband and I and that yappy little dog we got. <laughs> and uh, that's it. We are, we are the most important thing, meaning me. <laughs> 
That's great. Um, just um, one last question for you about, um, you know, um, your experiences of uh, managing and living with heart failure during COVID-19. Uh, oh my God. Can you, you tell know, me a little bit about what's that been, that's been like? Yeah, in, in Ontario, the doctors closed up their offices, rolled up the sidewalks and they closed up their offices and there was no care for two years. That was despicable. Because the doctors had all moved around, they were all working out of different places. It was really, really hard to get a hold of anybody. And uh, in March of 2020, in March of 2021, I'm sorry, it had been a year and I couldn't get any doctors and I also could not get any uh, blood work done because the, the, the labs were just overrun with uh, appointments. And so I had to go to the hospital to get checked out. And uh, I called an ambulance, went to emergency. And uh, what they found out was that my calcium was so high that it was dangerously high and that my potassium was so low that I it was negligible. So um, I kind of had that out with my doctors, right? I couldn't get a hold of my pulmonary guy, although he did call me every six months. In between, it was extremely hard to get a hold of him. My cardiologist was working at a different place with a different number, and I couldn't get a hold of them. Uh, so yeah, I screamed when I got into the hospital and I told them, you know, this was not, this is not good. This is not, um, this is not the way that things should be. We should have access uh, to better health care than having to end up in the emergency. And they kept me for a week and I was like, I don't need to be here. You know, I'm just, I'm wasting. I don't want to be exposed to all these people. I didn't want to be out in COVID, um, but I had no choice. Yeah, that sounds like it's been, that was so tough. Oh my God, it was a terrible time. My calcium was so high that I could not put any weight on my on my feet. Um, it's, it's just the product of having high calcium. And I was on all these calcium supplements from when I was first diagnosed that had never been managed properly. And um, even when my doctor did a med review with me, um, she didn't seem to think that there was anything wrong with the amount of calcium that I was taking, but it was obviously too much for me. So um, not sure why that happened, but um, shouldn't have, it shouldn't have been that hard to get somebody. And for just, just now, uh, the doctors are starting to open up just now a little bit, right? So I, okay. I, th I think it's terrible for people. People have been waiting for surgeries and specialists and stuff like that it's there's no need for this yeah all the elective surgeries were, were canceled at pretty much all right mm -hmm. yeah um now barbara is there anything else you would like to share is there are there any questions that you you wish i had asked you or you know i'll think about them an hour from now <laughs> <laughs> sounds good and if you do just fire fire off an email to me please okay um, I, I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your experience um, um, with me. And uh, I need to look at uh, this Catch Your Breath 60 um, group that you told me about. And <laughs> um, Yeah, well, I have a blog that I haven't been active with, but my books are there. Yeah. Um, and I'm on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Catch Your Breath 60. Uh, I do a tea time on Tuesday afternoons. Um, for half an hour, and uh, we do some uh, Zoom meetings uh, later in the week. So, no, that's yeah. amazing. That's great. And how many people yeah. are in your in your in your group? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I have eighteen hundred follow nineteen hundred following me. Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't know how many are active. Yeah. Um. Okay, Barbara. I want to stop the recording now. Okay.